The topic is orthostatic intolerance, abbreviated OI. I'm uh, studying only young people, which includes people up to the age of 29 now, and our practice is primarily younger than that. But uh, as my children aged past their 20s, uh, my definition of pediatrics has changed accordingly. An important point I'd like to make, which I think in the other version I made outstanding, but here is that at ortho, the word orthostasis is often used to mean orthostatic intolerance. And what it really means is standing upright. So a patient who becomes orthostatic means uh, that they stood up in front of you. And, and hopefully most people can. Uh, on the other hand, orthostatic intolerance, uh, I, I, I think this definition may come from David Robertson at Vanderbilt, but um, I think it's well defined by an inability to tolerate remaining upright. Uh, because of various signs, uh, things you can measure, and symptoms, and that uh, at least to some extent, these need to be uh, relieved by becoming recumbent by lying down again. I, I believe a corollary of this is that if the symptoms initiate while supine, then there's no orthostatic intolerance. I mean, that may be a bone of contention to some people here. Well, standing is one of two uh, daytime, everyday, diurnal, physiologic stressors, the other being exercise. And while very excellent animal models using uh, quadrupeds exist for exercise, for the most part, animals don't stand upright. And those that do, apart from humans, you don't really want to work with while they're conscious. Uh, because they may tear you in half. Um, even rhesus monkeys are difficult and uh, don't like what you're doing to them. The, the reason this is important is that the distribution of blood vessels and of blood within those blood vessels is quite different in, in humans. And when you're upright, um, approximately, I don't know, 500 to 800 mLs of blood is translocated into the lower half of the body below uh, an indifferent point, roughly the diaphragm. And this doesn't really occur in quadrupeds who uh, have the blood at one level. Uh, one of the corollaries of this is, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but your, your cats and dogs don't have calves. They, they don't need them. Um, but we do. And we uh, use them in part to uh, respond to circulatory stress. If there were no, other, no defenses and you translocated 500 to 1,000 mLs of blood into your legs uh, within a short period of time, you would become unconscious. But we don't. And the reason for that is that we have various defenses. The, the most effective probably is the um, skeletal muscle pump. and. Uh, often uh, another pump, which relates to our breathing and abdominal pressures, uh, which propel blood up towards the central uh, cavity, the thorax. Um, we, we have also cardio, direct cardiopulmonary interactions that need to be intact for, for us to compensate. Uh, of course, uh, vascular structure can get in the way of uh, uh, an adequate response. Uh, varicosities come to mind right away. but. Uh, and many of those patients become intolerant of uh, the upright position. And, and of course, if you have no blood, that, that would, would hurt you too. That would be very difficult to push blood around adequately if you have run short. Um, but for the most part, what we'll focus on here are, um, I hesitate to, hesitate to say abnormalities in vascular regulation, but vascular regulation uh, uh, and oxygen delivery. And I, I kind of think of that as, as two sorts, uh, the kind of uh, regulation that's fast in onset, largely autonomic, and in part local reflexes that depend on um, intrinsic properties of muscle myogenic response, uh, flow-mediated responses, and slower responses, which um, uh, take a, a much longer time span. These are on the order of seconds. Um, these are on the order of minutes to hours in, in uh, gene expression, uh, many hours, days, and so forth. So how can this uh, affect the way we respond to being orthostatic? Well, they, they set up uh, a background, a tonic background, so that, for example, uh, here's this is nitric oxide. It's not simply telling you no and angiotensin II, which uh, are, are very potent regulators 
of the autonomic nervous system, uh, but they change more slowly, yet uh, if angiotensin is present in great amount uh, circulating or in the brain, it has profound effects on sympathetic activation. Most of OI, uh, therefore, constitutes abnormalities, I would say, of adrenergic regulation um, and in the modulation of adrenergic vasoconstriction, and we'll get to what that means. I just wanted to show you a normal circulatory response. Uh, note that normally the heart rate goes up substantially. Here it shows, I don't know, 20, 25, more. And uh, typically for an adult, it's taken to be 30 if you're standing quietly or, or tilted. Stroke volume goes down considerably more, about 40%, but because of the increased heart rate, the amount your heart pumps only drops by about 20%, but it, it drops considerably while you're standing quietly. Uh, of course, all this changes if you start exercising, muscle pumps come into play, and all sorts of things happen to uh, encourage uh, uh, much more than uh, supplying um, a cardiac output. Blood pressure typically goes up slightly, more diastolic than systolic, and so the difference between systolic and diastolic of pulse pressure drops, and many people use that as an index also of stroke volume, and it works pretty well. So stroke volume drops. But the reason blood pressure goes up is because we have a large compensatory change in, in the peripheral vascular resistance. Well, to, to study orthostatic intolerance, we impose an orthostatic stress. And while standing is, this is called standing wave. They're from Canada. I couldn't resist. Um, it's very neat, yeah. Um, it, it is probably the best and most physiologic way to test this. Uh, only very recently have there been any validation of standing tests, uh, and, and only in adults so far. So. I can't really tell you what a standing test is. I can tell you what other people do. Um, tilt has been used uh, very frequently, usually to about 70 degrees or 60 degrees. And I, I shouldn't, this is my daughter when she was 19, and I always used to say she's smiling because she's getting paid. She didn't faint, she was fine. But, but my shock was at finding this picture in about uh, five different presentations at other meetings because it's, you know, it's in, in the Google images somewhere. Uh, you can get more elaborate, and often people use as a substitute something called lower body negative pressure, where someone's in a, a device, your lower half's in this device, and blood is literally sucked into your feet. Um, this is a, a very good surrogate hemorrhage, and not so good standing, but as you'll see later, my belief and many others is that uh, uh, the fainting reflex, which is the first use to which tilt table was placed, is, uh, is, is the, faint, is the uh, normal human response to, to hemorrhage. Uh, uh, when we get to fainting, we'll talk about it. You can certainly make this test very complex, and I certainly have, but <laughs> and, and measure everything under the sun. But basically, you need to have at least a blood pressure monitor. And this shows no blood pressure cuff, because that would be too simple. And uh, some measure of, of heart rate, usually an electrocardiogram. Um, but as you can see, you can, we, we tend to bundle this with all sorts of measurements of uh, blood volume, blood flow, and so forth. One of the most useful things, because of its importance in terms of blood flow regulation in the brain, is, is capnography, a measurement of carbon dioxide. And I think a lot of people these days uh, will use this, and a lot of patients have um, alterations in respiration that can be very important. And then later on, we started focusing, and many others do, on measurements of brain blood flow. Uh, this is the original Ketty Schmidt, which uses an inert gas. This is transcranial Doppler. This is some kind of near-infrared spectroscopy, which I've never seen. It's the only weird picture I could get off the web. And uh, a few people, I think this is uh, um, Kevin Shoemaker have done uh, functional MRI imaging along with uh, non-metallic containing lower body negative pressure devices. Uh, a lot is made out of false positive tilt tests, and this is particularly true in kids. That is, you take someone who has never fainted, 
Uh, l l let me just say that until perhaps five or six years ago, and still in many hands, uh, positive tilt test means you fainted, a negative tilt test means you don't. A and that's a little bit of a short uh, uh, myopic view of, of what it's capable of in terms of determining um, um, uh, patterns of blood flow and blood pressure regulation and would preclude POTS, for example, because they don't faint for the most part uh, during tilt table tests. But in addition, a lot of uh, people who hadn't fainted, um, particularly young people, will faint. One of those was my son. And on further questioning, he said, oh, you know, I do feel dizzy a lot of the time. And I, I, I find that if I move around a lot, it goes away. So that's that evocation of the skeletal muscle pump. A lot of people who faint themselves, like normally it's, it's good to assume anti-gravity postures, which I'll show you a little bit. And someone actually quantitated this. This was in Roger Hainsworth's laboratory, where they actually measured postural sway in those with so-called false positive tilt table tests. And indeed, they were moving all over the place. So. Uh, what, what that means to say is that there are a whole lot more fainters out there than we actually know about. Uh, this rather complicated slide is from uh, Dr. Raj's paper recently, which was the first to do a validated standing test. And what he's done is show um, POTS people standing and tilted and uh, versus a large number of control patients. And he showed, if I can sort this out correctly, which I probably can't, that um, standing in his hands was actually, up to 10 minutes, was actually uh, 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 a better way than tilting. Uh, certainly you get a bigger rise uh, during a tilt test um, than in a standing test in patients because you're immobilizing them. That's really all a tilt test is. It's a standing test with um, um, uh, quieting down of the skeletal muscle pump. Uh, you stop them from moving. So that he showed in his particular test that you can uh, do a 10 minute stand, a longer stand or a longer tilt was far less specific and sensitive. And so we're stuck with a 10 minute screening test for POTS in an adult. Uh, postscript is that the way he did this test is have his subjects lie down for an entire hour beforehand and I don't believe they're allowed to eat and therefore, in a strict sense, this is only applicable to people who have been lying down for an entire hour because fluid redistribution occurs. If you stand, it goes to your feet. And if you're old like me, it stays there for quite a while. And if you use various methods, you can actually see uh, fluid slowly shifting out of the lower body towards the upper body as, as, you, as you lie down over a period of many minutes to perhaps about an hour or two. Anyway. Um, we define orthostatic intolerance uh, by this inability to tolerate being upright. And um, the way I look upon it is that the major symptoms that uh, provoke the need to lie down are, are symptoms that relate uh, to uh, most likely to cerebral perfusion abnormalities. Uh, loss of consciousness in a fainter would, would certainly be one of those to a lesser extent lightheadedness uh, which I guess is preferred to dizziness in, in our patients. Uh, cognitive deficits would certainly occur, headache, another one, and then uh, fatigue, which often uh, the ictal here is not referring to a seizure, it's referring to a faint, uh, often is worse after a faint, and it seems to be the rule for adults, less common in, in children. Uh, and that's really interesting since the, the faint is a clear ischemic event uh, and uh, then there's a post-ischemic fatigue, so it probably represents a reperfusion response. Other symptoms are related mostly to uh, uh, activation or inactivation of aspects of the autonomic nervous system, as you see here. But I, I can't think of anyone who really sits down because they're sweating too much. Can you? I don't know. Excess, you can. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to talk m more specifically about some simple variants that are particularly seen in kids that would probably exclude orthostatic hypotension for the most part. And um, the first will be uh, initial orthostatic hypotension. This 
follows a scheme that's repeated in a, a review article that I wrote in pediatrics this past May. And uh, this is really all I came up with, although newer variants or other forms of OI are, are out there. Uh, the first is initial orthostatic hypothesis. I didn't name it this, uh, Wuda Wheeling did, and um, he should take credit. But if you stand up rapidly, you get dizzy. Yes, no, can we take a vote? Depends on your age, athletic ability. Oh, well, I certainly experienced that, and, and so did all of my control subjects for the most part. And, and there's a, a, a fall of blood pressure that tends to be at a low point somewhere around 15 or 20 seconds out. Um, uh, we can go into reasons why the delay, it's associated with an increase in heart rate and some other changes that you see here, and that spontaneously resolves. So I've taken some of these kids whose blood pressures drop in half, and I've had two people hold them upright, which you're not supposed to do, right? And they recover. On the other hand, I've had one fainter. So one of the ways you can fight this off is to use um, um, uh, uh, physical countermeasures by way of saying that this is by far the most common form of orthostatic intolerance, if you want to call it that. And in that review that I wrote, I, I fought a lot with a reviewer who truly wanted this to be cast as abnormal, but, it, but it's not. It's, it's just normal. I have had a couple faint, all of them with growth and change in body configuration have recovered. Uh, all of them will respond to physical countermeasures. This is like crossing, or also known if the hands are in front as the cocktail party stance. And it is a, 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 a physical countermeasure, which is largely pushing blood back, but also ha can have effect on uh, um, vascular resistance in the legs. Squatting just shoots everything upwards, and it's probably about as effective as lying down, which isn't put here. You can, of course, lie down. And uh, down here is something we investigated in others as well, which is um, uh, an orthostatic, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a um, isometric contraction. Uh, and what that does is engage a reflex that we all have called the exercise presser reflex, which means that at the very beginning of exercise, with even thinking about it, uh, blood pressure goes up. Uh, it usually takes a few seconds, though. And so in, when we tested this out, we had folks doing it while they were lying down and then jumping up and then preventing the, the fall in blood pressure. But it works pretty well. Switching now briefly to orthostatic hypotension, um, since I rarely see this, it has a precise definition now made by consensus, uh, 20 millimeters systolic, 10 diastolic, within three minutes of standing or tilt. So you can do this by standing. Um, I would say, remember, there's initial orthostatic hypotension. If you are really fast with a blood pressure cuff, you can see it. And then you will think that they have something really wrong, but they don't. I think what you need to do is, is start taking the blood pressure at, at about a minute out there, and you should be safe. Um, by far, in the younger patients, the most common uh, form of OH is non-neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. And the most common reason for that is some form of hypovolemia. These other illnesses you see here that seem uh, perhaps unrelated to hypovolemia actually produce orthostatic intolerance as well by hypovolemia. So this is a, a FIO produces this by a pressure diuresis. I actually saw an Addison's kid. He had multiple endocrinopathy. He had already had the diagnosis. And his endocrinologist sent him to me because he was dizzy. And I said, why? <laughs> I mean, you know, he had just started taking his replacement, and then he got fine. Neurogenic orthostatic hypotension also has a consensus definition, and it is always identified with vas adrenergic vasoconstrictor failure. So if you see this, which we have defined up here, and it's not due to these things or drugs, then you know what's wrong, and you kind of know how to fix it. You have to give them something that provides adrenergic support. It's simple. I had two children ever, one very recently, who had isolated orthostatic hypotension that was adrenergic failure without any other autonomic problems. 
On the other hand, in adults, there are people who uh, have a, a, a wide variety of autonomic problems, and uh, many of them go fall under the heading of, of primary autonomic failure. There's MSA, which is here, and I don't know much about it, so I'm not going to talk about it. And um, um, uh, Parkinson's disease, also genetic syndromes, which are rare. I haven't had a single case of uh, DBH deficiency, although I look for it across the labs, a lot of the people, a lot of them. Autoimmune ganglionopathy can present this way. And probably the most common reasons are secondary uh, presentations of diabetes and so forth. Note that the uh, autonomic, uh, uh, cardiovascular autonomic disability and diabetes coincides with peripheral autonomic neuropathies, but that they need not always go together. Uh, note also that there's an inappropriate lack of heart rate response in most of these patients as compared to what you saw with uh, um, um, non-neurogenic. There's nothing wrong with their um, autonomic nervous system, right? I mean, they're, they're just so that they are capable of mounting a tachycardia. The rest of the time we'll be spent talking mostly about these two. It's POTS on the left and um, simple faint of postural vasovagal syncope on the right. Um, this is distinguished by an excessively high heart rate. And of course, that, uh, and as originally defined, it was tachycardia in the absence of hypotension. Okay, mean arterial pressure, heart rate. POTS, uh, I'm sorry, uh, vasovagal syncope, um, just for your viewing pleasure. You should note the change in heart rate here. You see? It is, say, 60 odd to almost 120. So I'm watching this guy, and he has symptoms. And I say, well, you've, you've got POTS, you know, right? and then he faints. And I say, oh, you're, you're fainting. And this is very peculiar. How can you, um, you know, go back and forth? And so a number of people have defined uh, things like POTS with hypotension. Of course, that's saying you have excessive tachycardia without hypotension with hypotension. Makes no sense. Right? That's what I'm saying. Uh, some here, our chairman included, would say you can have POTS and vasovagal syncope at the same moment in time. That's not been my experience. We have had POTS patients who have started off as fainters. And um, there certainly are a lot of common features to them which can go to explain things. But I found that uh, history taking is, is the usual uh, distinguishing feature. Most of my uh, syncope patients are episodically ill and for the most part healthy. Most of my POTS patients are episodically healthy and the most part sick. So they are day to day uh, or chronic orthostatic intolerance. So that's originally the Vanderbilt people called what they saw, chronic orthostatic intolerance. The Mayo people called it postural tachycardia syndrome. Uh, they actually called it postural orthostatic tachycardia. And then for reasons of redundancy, remove orthostatic because postural and orthostatic were the same. And they, they won out. And, and these are generally day-to-day -day symptoms of OI, excessive uh, tachycardia without hypotension. And here's the definition in adults. And, here is probably the adolescent uh, definition, probably, I say. I think most people are now using 40 as the cutoff. But it's, it's a lot higher than this. And that's because in studies of healthy people, we've all seen healthy, particularly athletes and folks like that who have a, a low resting heart rate. They'll have, perhaps, sometimes, a very large delta. As a, as a, and there's nothing wrong with them. One thing, way to distinguish them from uh, a normal person is because is that they won't have any symptoms. You know, if you're asymptomatic, what what are you going to be treating anyway? You know, uh, and then last, they need to be improved by by recumbence, which of course is true of all. OI. Um, I, this is my personal classification now, which has changed over the years. Um, there are some who have what looks to be uh, channel defects at the sinoatrial node. Uh, some of these are called uh, inappropriate sinus tachycardia. I, I, it's very hard to distinguish these from POTS, and, and I don't want to discuss about them uh, anymore, except to say that there's a drug out there in Europe called Evabradine, which works primarily on the sinus node and will slow your heart rate down. 
and it works like a charm. Uh, we've used digoxin in some small children, which will slow their heart rates down, but um, it's shunned in the adult world and probably for good reasons. Uh, the next group, which fits a more classi uh, classical classification, is hyperadrenergic POTS, which I've defined as an increase in adrenergic activity. Notice that doesn't mean necessarily an increase in norepinephrine. Right? But, but, but this is just my personal definition. I don't know how it's defined because I've heard it every which way. POTS with high blood pressure. They're probably right. That, that probably is a form of this. POTS with high catecholamine. This I don't know because I haven't had too many POTS patients who haven't had the catecholamines that are somewhat elevated. This can occur because the sympathetic nerves are firing like crazy. Seen it once. When supine. When upright, I, I would go for that. Uh, or because the mechanisms that convert the sympathetic nerve impulse to um, contraction of smooth muscle of blood vessels or um, at the sinus node to fast heart rate have, have been altered. And I think this is a very major form of POTS, especially since we rarely uh, see uh, supine enhanced sympathetic nerve activity once, I think. And then something I've seen recently, which I'll, I'll show you, and it's in the process of write-up. Uh, it is true sympatho excitation in that their uh, sympathetic nerve activity is highly increased. And the next group is reflex, what I've renamed reflex, but it's almost often called neuropathic POTS. And it, it, it's a reflex tachycardia in response to thoracic or central hypovolemia. Basically, the autonomic nervous system, insofar as its detection of blood pressure and so forth, the concern is perfectly normal. The barrel reflexes work fine. Um, it's just as if you were dehydrated. And indeed, some of these people have, a, as yet, an unexplained hypovolemia, absolute hypovolemia. And fluorineph, erythropoietin, and other things have been tried. For the most part, this has been shunned by many for reasons of side effects and complications. Uh, another group has a regional redistribution, so too much blood goes to the legs, which is the first pickup of neuropathic POTS. Uh, published in New England Journal by Jacob et al. from Vanderbilt. And, and then the uh, group uh, of patients who seem to pool in the gut. And, and what's interesting here is that we see pooling in the gut in fainters, so that the initial physiology is very, very similar. At uh, last, I include gravitational deconditioning. And, and lest it be confused, I'm sure you, you've all heard something about deconditioning causing, causing POTS, right? Well, they're mixing their metaphors. This is mostly Ben Levine and then the Mayo people. Um, a sedentary um, lifestyle does not produce POTS. Is that fair to say? Anybody out there want to fight? It doesn't. It just doesn't. But bed rest sure does. Okay. And what what happened is that people discovered in uh, microgravity experiments, let's call them, in, in astronauts, that they all came back to Earth and they all had orthostatic intolerance, briefly at least. They found that if people were put in bed, they duplicated the findings of of astronauts. Right? Uh, I think I have a list of what that is. And finally, there's an animal model, which is rather hair-raising, or, or tail-raising. It's called the hind limb suspension model at Brad. So first, I'll go, go through a few things out of interest in hyperadrenergic POTS. And the most interesting thing is, is this norepinephrine transporter deficiency. Perhaps you've heard about the mutation that has happened in exactly one family in the world, which fortuitously contained identical twins, which is really terrific. That they are mutated, but investigators in Australia, however, having performed vein biopsies on an assortment of patients with POTS discovered um, in veins, remember it's veins, it's not arteries, that they seem to have a relative de uh, deficiency in the net protein, and this is woohoo, epigenetic. It's not, they don't have a mutation, they have a down regulation. 
It's not even a SNP. And one of the, th the consequences of this is that they had a uh, tremendous spillover of norepinephrine, and this was measured by radioisotope techniques that are not in ordinary practice, but they were able to show for sure that um, across vascular beds we had an excess amount of norepinephrine present within the synapses. So this is hyperadrenergic. Is this sympathetic activation? Well, it turns out that norepinephrine excess inside the brain, if anything, reduces sympathetic outflow. Sounds weird. It is. But for the most part, technically, they found no real big difference in sympathetic nerve traffic. Um, don't look at this. <laughs> um, uh, this was, um, I, I show this because this was one model we came up with, which had um, uh, overproduction of angiotensin II and a decrease in nitric oxide uh, through some very hair-raising scheme producing uh, this problem. Uh, and what, they, what was actually found is a deficiency in um, metabolism of angiotensin II, so more of it built up. It's an ACE2 deficiency. ACE2 is not the same as ACE1, but it's, it, it serves as the metabolizing factor. It, it seems to be a stereotype in many different illnesses and occurs in various forms of hypertension and heart failure. And what's really, really interesting here is it normalizes with exercise. Exercise cures most of the things. Um, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm, oh, no, I think that's later, sorry. Um, just to tantalize you, if this will tantalize you, we, we had seen a number of POTS patients, at least they were billed as such, whose principal or chief complaint was, uh, was dyspnea most of the time. And what we found instead was uh, a very rapid onset of uh, deep breathing, uh, usually slow, sometimes not, uh, so postural hyperpnea. It turns out they have very complicated interplay between cerebral blood flow and CO2, but the consequence of a very low CO2 hypocapnia from the hyperpnea is that uh, blood vessels in your brain contract and you get greatly diminished cerebral blood flow. Uh, also, as the ventilation increases, you have this very interesting and parallel increase in sympathetic nerve activity and almost all of these people develop uh, in parallel hypertension. This is all um, produced by central ischemic reflex or hypoxic ischemic central reflex. It's hyperadrenergic, but if you control ventilation and, and the actual trigger is central hypo, sudden central hypovolemia. Neuropathic POTS may make some more sense to you. These show uh, changes in uh, blood volume in four compartments. Um, and this would be a healthy control, and this would be a POTS patient uh, with the uh, uh, excess leg pooling variant of, of neuropathic POTS. And you can see that the amount of blood that a decrease in blood is, is larger here in the POTS patient and increase in blood in the legs here is larger in the POTS patient as well. And this shows the norepinephrine spillover experiments that showed that they were relatively denervated in their legs. They didn't have as much norepinephrine. Uh, we saw a very similar pattern, but of course we didn't measure spillover in patients who had pooling instead in the gut circulation. And, and so I would now classify that as a form of neuropathic POTS, uh, partial denervation. Um, we have recently, I think now, published on the effects of mitodrine in these two variants. And in our hands, at least, in a very small double-blind crossover study, we found a good effect of mitodrine in neuropathic POTS. And it's hard to say no effect. Here's the delta heart rate, and you can see that this is baseline, and this is the POTS patient after uh, the, the, the mitogen, neuropathic POTS patient. Clear difference with the placebo, which is over here. Uh, but here, uh, it also seems different from baseline, doesn't it? 
but it's not different from placebo. So what you'd conclude here is the hyperadrenergic group is having a placebo response that's very strong. And that's, that's really very interesting. I, I don't know where to go from here. We just sort of came up with this right now. So should you give patients placebo? I, I have grouped the pot stuff, pox fact, factoids, which you know is uh, female, a vast preponderance, usually some form of prior inflammatory event, uh, association with ehlers danlos hypermobility type, uh, defects in cerebral autoregulation, you know about cognitive defects, exercise intolerance. Um, this is my own personal observation, um, association with anorexia nervosa, how's that, instead of low BMI. But certainly when we, we looked at the groupings, there was a difference in, in the MI. And all of them would fit a sort of hyperadrenergic vasoconstrictive profile. Um, blood pressure, pale, but it's mostly those who are vasoconstricted. Beta blocker, some have shown its use. I'm not particularly happy with it, although it certainly reduces your heart rate. I'm not sure it does much more. Alpha-1 agonists would be the mitodrine, which, which I kind of discussed already. Volume loading seems to help everybody, and um, um, uh, although fludrocortisone may not, um, we have done volume loading with saline, of course, uh, with variable uh, effects, but we've also used other forms of rehydration, which I'll get to. Mestinon. Um, uh, seems to be a wonder drug in some hands, and I, I can discuss when it is and when it isn't. I'm adding two more, which are probably important in hyperadrenergic states, and they would seem to be coming from left field, but they're really not. Both of these um, uh, are antioxidants. Uh, this is uh, an angiotensin um, substances, uh, antagonists. Um, water has been used as palliation for all forms of orthostatic intolerance. Usually 16 ounces of water after it clears the stomach produces an osmo reflex that depends on receptors, um, I think trip before receptors in the um, um, portal vein. Salt, uh, I've only really seen significant effects in the literature and in my own hands when a lot of salt is used, I'm talking like 10 extra grams a day. Uh, and which is usually unpalatable. Nobody's going to take it, but others have had better luck than I. IV saline, yes. We've used oral rehydration salts. I, I, I've been trying to get my associate to publish this. It was supposed to be a grant. Uh, it probably works. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with o ORS. If you're not, just, just look it up. It's the, um, uh, the answer to uh, um, typhus and diarrhea throughout the world. Um, except for the U.S. You can't buy it in your CVS, but you can go to Antigua, where I first bought it, and pick it up. And a corollary of everything here is avoid bed rest. And this tells you why. Bed rest impairs your bowel reflex. Bed rest reduces your blood volume. Bed rest, and the worst part of bed rest is, is this. This is the most deadly part in terms of us manned space mission to Mars. Uh, they won't have any bones left when they come back. And, and this does not seem to be very reversible. You lose blood vessels, you lose skeletal muscle, the muscle pump, you lose red cell mass. So don't let them stay in bed. It's, it, they'll tell you they can't get out of bed, but um, the Ben Levine exercise, Texas exercise program starts with re rehabbing people on bed rest and it was developed in response to gravitational deconditioning. And, and that's here. Here's a reference to the, one of the first articles from him, and the second, where um, an exercise program was compared with a beta blocker and worked better. And, and I've had some experience because we sent them patients and also because we've had people continue. In, in my hands, they almost all feel better, but they're not cured. And, and when they relapse off their exercise because of some intercurrent ill, they don't feel good anymore. Then that's a problem. If you stand up, your cerebral blood flow in a normal human being doesn't recover if you're standing still. In fact, it grows progressively worse. 
And that's normal, and it's much more abnormal in here's the normal response. It's kind of fuzzy, and here's someone who faints, and you can see it's somewhat more exaggerated. I'll pass this by. Uh, I think it's useful to define syncope, at least the one, definition I know from the 2009 consensus is a transient loss of consciousness postural tone that's produced by global cerebral hypoperfusion and they need to recover spontaneously. So all you have to do is measure the cerebral blood flow to, de to define syncope, not blood pressure. And there have been some patients diagnosed with so-called cerebral syncope in which blood pressure doesn't seem to be primary. Um, anyway, uh, but most often you'll see systemic hypotension. And, and what you should know is that it's enormously common. 40% of people will have one or more episodes during their lifetime. And the best predictor of multiple episodes is that uh, multiple episodes. Somebody actually wrote that and it was just rewritten. That <laughs> the best predictor of episodes is episodes. Isn't that neat? Yeah. Anyway, syncope uh, can be nasty, right? The nasty syncope is either orthostatic hypotension and not of, of, the, of, the, of the true autonomic or neurogenic kind, or, or cardiac syncope, largely arrhythmic, but also some forms of structural or uh, myopathic heart disease. You don't want that. And, and they have to be treated specifically. Maybe not so nasty are the reflex forms except uh, this could either be deglutition syncope, so-called swallow syncope, or someone who's fainted into uh, spaghetti and he's drowning in spaghetti. And it's happened, right? People, people will, will faint and then because they happen to be in harm's way, they'll die. Now, actually, I'm the only person I know have a fainting patient who fell off a cliff. But it, how can that be? Uh, because they would die, they'd never become a patient. Um, he, he landed on a ledge. So it happens, it's famous. But more famous now is uh, so-called asystolic syncope. And uh, this is a variant of simple faint, of vasovagal syncope, in which the heart stops. Um, the, it's punctuated, largely you're supposed to recover from this. It's, it usually is extremely abrupt, it uh, is fairly frequent, and they almost always hurt themselves. But they usually recover from this, and I've seen it. Nowadays, in adults, uh, the literature is highly supportive of putting a pacemaker in. Not because they'll die if you don't do it, but they'll, they won't hurt themselves and episodes will come down. Um, there are various forms of reflex syncope. Vasovagal is the main subject, but I just wanted to measure, mention two what appear to be unique pediatric ailments. One is hair grooming syncope. Don't know what does it. And it's not always the hair dryer. And the other is adolescent stretch syncope, which is probably kinking of the vertebral artery. It's some very good literature about it. This is fairly typical, what I see with syncope, which is a increase in heart rate. But looking at the blood pressure, I often see a, a stable blood pressure followed by a gradual fall in blood pressure, followed by an abrupt fall. Uh, the events that actually happen here uh, are a fall in cerebral perfusion preceding the fall in blood pressure by many seconds, and sometimes without the fall of blood pressure, which would be that central syncope. But always, the cerebral blood flow falls first. How can this be? We will not discuss how this can be. Then this falls, and then heart rate falls in some variable time relation, but in sequence, as, as I explained. Oh, many times, if you don't wait long enough, you'll call it vasodepressor, because the heart rate hasn't fallen yet. But so how do you explain? The only thing I've been seeking to explain so far is, is phase two, because it's, it has common features in both fainters and pots. And it seems to be well explained by an excessive fall in central blood volume, thoracic blood volume, that's caused by an uh, excessive increase in spikenic blood volume, so that it's identical in form to the second form of neuropathic POTS. But these guys aren't supposed to faint. I mean, sorry, these guys faint, but the neuropathic POTS with the same thing don't. Um, this just shows what happens to their peripheral resistance, so we can move on from there. But I did want to show this. And 
These are our classic experiments performed during World War II, uh, naturally, in, in Britain, uh, in the laboratory of Sharpie Schaefer um, uh, by Barcroft and Associates, in which they performed 1,100 ml uh, hemorrhages. And, and what it shows, really, is uh, an identical pattern of change in blood pressure, uh, a slow fall, followed by the rapid fall off. And many people will call this the, 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 a two-phase response, but often they're referring to stable blood pressure, unstable blood pressure. For the most part, there are really three phases. This phase is associated with an increase in heart rate and in peripheral resistance, and uh, then uh, both blood pressure and heart rate uh, fall uh, tremendously. What's really interesting is that hemorrhage has been studied very extensively in animals, uh, including baboons, but mostly under anesthesia. Um, and, and what they found is that uh, during hemorrhage, the uh, subject becomes unresponsive to catecholamines, and in particular to norepinephrine. This is probably a very common experience when you're treating a shock patient, right? They might, I remember wrong, they used to become refractory to uh, uh, norepinephrine. Well, it turns out that this is related to an elaboration of nitric oxide in the midst of fainting that goes uh, misunderstood. And when that was blocked or you NO know, was interfered with, the response to norepinephrine was restored. And so this is a commercial part, uh, and this is where we're going right now. We um, did some experiments. Actually, here we're just looking at the cutaneous circulation, which can, I don't know, what does this have to do with anything? Uh, it actually serves as a reasonable surrogate for many other forms. And, and what we found was that um, uh, fainters had a um, <coughs> response to increasing norepinephrine, which is in red, which you can't see which is deficient compared to the control subject. And, and they also um, elaborated more uh, um, um, nitric oxide. Um, and you could also, this is too complicated, you could also see that if you block nitric oxide in the patients, they uh, had a, a profound change in their um, threshold to faint. We, we use um, various devices to ensure that our patients faint. And so I'm, I'm offering you the rare opportunity to send me some subjects who have three or more faints and are between 14 and 29 years of age and who really want to get to the bottom of this. Uh, this is the whole thesis. It also is highly applicable to neuropathic POTS, as I explained. Just the factoids here on vasovagal syncope. Uh, again, it's a female preponderance, but largely uh, a little bit better, two to one. And uh, most of the boys that I've seen are, have a, a similar phenotype in that they're slender and growing rapidly. Uh, so it may have something to do with growth hormone, I'm, I'm not sure. And any girls have to do with, with estrogen. Um, you need to rule out cardiogenic uh, syncope and um, it's really important. I, I, I think Ben Levine in an article I just read, reread emphasize that uh, until you know differently. And of course, he's dealing with adults where they're more likely to have uh, cardiac origin of fainting. You really must um, ensure that they're not having a heart event of some sort. Um, of course, if they've had you know 10 episodes and they're still alive, they probably haven't had any heart events. So you have the tincture of time. Um, vasovagal syncope is not deadly unless you're in harm's way. Um, there is recently been shown a contribution from iron, uh, anemia, and, and ferritin, which we can discuss and has everything to do with nitric oxide again. Um, it's more common in athletes than sedentary people. If you want to discuss that, we can do that. Um, and uh, the diagnosis is not made by tilt table tests, it's made by history. So what you're looking for in a vasovagal syncope patient is the prodrome, the description of the faint itself, that it, usually not 20 minutes, you know, um, often it's called a coma by that time, and, and what they feel like afterwards, usually very tired, uh, sometimes very headachy, and so forth. Tilt tests 
in children, we don't know the answer to this, but in adults, apparently, the FILT results have no correlation with real life fainting. Um, appearance, uh, adult studies, and these included some kids, very large studies. The current one, these are the prevention of syncope trials run from Canada. Post one tested a beta blocker, didn't work better than placebo. Post two tested fludrocortisone, didn't work better than placebo. And now we're up to mitodrine. And so far, um, nothing has worked better than placebo. If they're asystolic syncope, you might consider uh, a pacemaker. If they're not asystolic syncope, for the most part, most casual fainters can uh, deal with um, with fainting using those physical countermeasures that I showed you by lying down fast and then by using the 16 ounce water cure, which really works. If you fainted, you're likely to faint again on the same day, especially if well-intentioned relatives stand you up, you know, and I've seen this. It's described as three faints in, a, in the same day, but it was really one where they persistently did this. And I have a, a kid who was trapped upright in a subterranean sub-basement of Grand Central Station uh, on a tour. I, I can't think why in anyone in their right mind would want to go to the bottom, a stinky bottom of Grand Central Station, but she did. More than that, her mother was a fainter, and when the kid said, I don't feel good, I'm nauseated, blah, 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 and looked pale, she said, go tell your father. This is a big mistake, and then they kept her upright until and then, you know what happened? She went home and she slept three days in a row, she told me. It's really quite interesting. Don't stand. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, all right, so if it's no prodrome, if there's injury, if it's prolonged, if it's very frequent, you really have to think about this asystolic thing or perhaps cardiogenic again. This is now not diagnosed by Holter. It's diagnosed by a loop recorder starting, I guess, externally. But in adults now, they implant one. It's called an internal loop recorder. The most common device is made by, it's called a reveal, and it's made by um, uh, Medtronics, I think. And that's it for now.